The light bulb flickers in the school's restroom. The tiles on the floor are littered with soaked paper towels. The one gray stall door is marked with lewd messages, drawings of genitals, and unidentified sludge. Hunched over and sitting on the surprisingly clean and smooth wooden bench, one of the school's students, Marcus, rests his elbows on his knees while holding his jagged hair. He looks to his left to see his friend, Walter, standing against the wall. He's relaxed, and he's got his arms crossed. With an e-cigarette hanging from Walter's mouth, he softly blows out a cloud every few seconds. It almost seems like, with each exhale, he is attempting to release a perfect ring. Nevertheless, he is far from perfecting a single trick. A phone rings out of the blue, coming from Marcus's jean pocket. The music sounds like lo-fi hip-hop. He reaches for it only to find his mother calling. Marcus lets out a deep sigh and rubs his eyelids with the back of his left hand. With the phone screen reading Mom, he shows it to Walter. Walter takes out the e-cig from his mouth. Go. Walter states with a faint echo in the restroom. It's your mom. Can't leave her mad at you. Hearing a slight sincerity in his voice, Marcus smirks at Walter. He stands up, looking at the exit door and then back to Walter. He gives Walter a confused look as if he's waiting for Walter to give him directions. Jesus crap, Walter sighs. Just, just go in the stall, I'm not listening to shit. Marcus opens the stall door and closes it behind him. After locking it, he rubs his right hand against his t-shirt, as if that is going to clean it. While the phone is ringing, Marcus is trying hard not to look at the toilet, due to the fact that someone poured their school lunch all over it. Spaghetti sauce lathers the seat and the floor around it. Whoever did this was probably bored but also in a hurry because a paper container plate is seen resting on the toilet tank cover. He answers the phone as quickly as he can and puts it to his ear. Hi mom, he swiftly states. As he listens to her, he tries to smile, hoping that whatever he says next sounds pleasant enough for his mom not to worry about anything. Yes, I'm in school and I'm just outside the classroom, Marcus says while nodding his head. A few seconds go by, and Marcus's eyes begin to dilate in fear. Oh, no, Marcus stutters. I'm, I'm in the hall, and no one's here. That's why, you know, the echo. The conversation continues with Marcus blandly responding with yes, mm-hmm, and mostly, I know. Outside the stall, Walter has his head tilted to the ceiling with one foot on the wall. As the brief conversation comes to an end, Marcus pauses in place. He stands stiff for a while, as if his mother just stated something he knows she doesn't regularly say. Me too, he stutters. Removing his phone from his ear, he stares at the screen in suspense. He's either expecting her to say something back or hang up. Not knowing what to do next, he leans in closer to the microphone. Bye, Mom, he swiftly states. He hangs up and puts his phone back in his pocket. Unlocking the stall door, he emerges staring down at the restroom tiles. He observes the smooth white squares perfectly aligned with each other. Each tile is the same as the one next to it. Not a single one before him is cracked or overlapping another. Marcus stares in contempt. He reaches in his back pocket and pulls out a jewel. He closes his eyes and takes a hit. While inhaling, he looks back at the toilet covered in spaghetti. Realizing how stupid the image he's looking at, he exhales a cloud quick and silently laughs to himself. Yo, why is she calling you during school hours? asks Walter. Marcus looks at Walter like he's stupid. She has... a night shift. What? Walter pauses and then a look of realization comes over his face. He stutters saying, oh, oh shit, my bad, I, I forgot about that. Am I going to show you this or not? Walter asks, embarrassed, changing the subject. Of course, Marcus says, closing the stall door. You want to start the show now? Pushing himself off the wall, Walter smirks back at Marcus. Yes, Walter proudly responds, changing his tone and gesturing towards the bench. Have a seat. They both sit down on the bench with Marcus leaning in, intrigued by what Walter is about to present. In a sarcastically comedic performance using over-the-top hand gestures, Walter begins his presentation. Isn't it a pain in your ass to constantly charge your jewel? Don't you want to vape with your boys without constantly plugging that stick back in the wall? Complain no more, no more! 
With the untitled Ultra Drill, you can vape for as long as you possibly want. Using the super advanced tech, we have finally reached the peak of pure relaxation. It has all of your favorite flavors to choose from. Fruit medley, cream boule, cool mint, mango, and even strawberry. As for risks, what risks? You really think your school's don't do drugs posters can scare your goofy ass? It's nicotine. It's not a fucking zombie virus, hopefully. So go online right now to get you a piece of the future at a limited time offer of only $69.99. Walter starts to mimic the fast-talking health risk part of the infomercial by blurting out incomprehensible gibberish. He holds up the jewel right next to his head. Ding, he says with an absurdly large grin on his face. Nodding his head, Marcus claps for Walter. With that out of the way, can you tell me the right price? Marcus asks. Yeah, yeah, it's actually uh, 30 bucks. Walter states, oh, and I'm just fucking with you about the zombie stuff. Marcus pulls out his wallet from his left pocket and searches for a 20. Walter is growing a bit impatient. Fondling through his wallet, Marcus pulls out two $10 bills, one $5 bill, four $1 bills, and 10 cents. He hands Walter all the money. Hey, Walter blabbers. This ain't enough, but I won't be a dick about it, so uh, here you go. Walter hands Marcus the prototype jewel. Now observing it fully on his own, Marcus notices that there is not a plug to put the charging dock for a regular jewel. He smiles to himself for a second only for that smile to transform into a more skeptical look. Why do I get a feeling that this has already been made before? He asks Walter. Well, Walter hesitates. Do you want to give it back and I'll just give you back your $29.10 back? Marcus looks at Walter like he's stupid. What? Walter blurts out. Dude, I already told you that my cousin is able to get his hands on some new cool shit. Walter stares at Marcus like a teacher lecturing their student. You remember meeting him, right? He asks. Marcus nods, analyzing the jewel. His stuff is legit, right? Walter asks. Marcus nods again. Okay, then try it out. Walter states as he leans in to see Marcus make his next move. With the jewel in his left hand, Marcus's right is gently placed on his lap. He moves his hand to the imprint of where his phone is in his pocket. Looking back and forth from the jewel to the phone, he rests on his next decision. He looks at Walter, who is eyeing Marcus's hand on his phone. He tucks his chin and gives Marcus a condescending look. Aggravated, Marcus's right hand pulls away from his pocket while his left hand gives his right the jewel. He shoves the mouthpiece between his lips and inhales. He feels a cool sensation making its way into his lungs. His eyes are closed and his head is raised up high. Knowing that this moment can end, he is relishing in it for every second he can. Swiftly removing the jewel from his mouth, he hesitantly blows out a huge cloud of nicotine. Opening his eyes, he sees Walter smiling at him. They both chuckle at the situation. Hey, what is the flavor I gave you again? Walter asks. Um, Marcus hesitates. It tastes like strawberries. They sit in silence. Marcus is unsure of what to feel. The taste has left his mouth. The moment has ended already. Is this the peak of relaxation that Walter was talking about? Thinking of what to say next, Marcus blurts out, Yo, f fuck what my mom was saying, this is really fucking good. I told you, Walter says with a proud look on his face. Well, you're welcome. Walter starts to head out the door. Hey, thanks man, Marcus says smiling. I really appreciate the door shuts behind Walter. Marcus stares at the exit as if he's expecting Walter to come back. His smile fades away. He lowers his head. Sighing, he looks up to see one of the urinals in front of him, where he spots another jewel resting on the drain. With a hint of regret, he starts to look at the jewel prototype in his hand, and then back to the jewel in the urinal. Knowing that someone purposely tossed it in there because it was that disposable, he wonders how he should feel about the jewel he is holding in his hand. He's nearly asleep. Slashing in his chair with his arms on his desk, Marcus's mind drifts out of the room. The muffled voice of Mr. Brody's history teachings only serve as background noise. The environment around him is blurry, not a single object in the room he can identify. Out of nowhere, Marcus feels a harsh slap against the back of his head. He jitters in his seat as his vision becomes clear. He looks back behind him and sees Elena giggling to herself with her hand over her mouth. She's wearing that brown leather jacket she always wears to school. Back in reality, he finds the room colder than usual. Everything seems brighter as if his eyes turn its settings to the highest saturation. He can vaguely hear his teacher. 
Yes, Billy, Mr. Brody says. African Americans were primarily used in the Tuskegee syphilis study because the experimenters thought that no one would search or care about them. I don't think I have to tell you that these experiments were cruel. Feeling a bit confused about what Mr. Brody is saying, although that wouldn't be the first, Marcus takes a deep breath, lays his right shoulder on the table, and places his palm on the side of his head. Now attempting to pay attention, Marcus is a bit more composed than a few seconds ago. As he starts to move his hand toward his ear, he feels something warm. He pulls his hand away from his head only to see a translucent red substance left on the palm of his hand. He squints his eyes, wondering if it's blood. It feels sticky. It's something that you might have coughed up. Knowing that it came out of his ear, he wonders if it's his brain matter or something far more uncanny. Marcus raises his hand. Yes, Mr. Brody says, pointing at Marcus. What do you need? Is it okay if I go use the bathroom? Marcus asks, as calmly as he could. With a hint of disappointment, Mr. Brody says, What? Can't you hold it in? We got only about fifteen. Mr. Brody's eyes travels to Marcus's raised hand. Squinting and leaning in, he spots the unidentified red goop on Marcus's hand. What the fu- Mr. Brody whispers to himself. Okay, you can go please, and uh, uh, go take the pass. Marcus gets out of his seat, takes the bathroom pass, and speed walks out of the door. On his way out, he could hear a couple classmates, including Lena, silently laughing at him. He's cupping his right ear in case anything else abnormal oozes out of it. On his walk towards the bathroom, he looks up at the school buildings. With his eyes being blinded by the sun, he notices how tall all of the buildings actually are, making him but an ant in a wide field of grass. Flinging the bathroom door open, he checks to see if anyone else is present. Marcus makes his way towards one of the mirrors in front of the sinks. There are no blemishes on his face until he moves his head to his left and spots the red goop leaking from his ear. He pulls out at least five pieces of paper towel from the dispenser. Wiping his hands at the side of his face and ear, he crunches the paper towel in order to fit it in his ear like a q-tip. A ball of white paper towel now rests in his ear. Feeling relief, Marcus turns on the sink and washes his hands. As he turns off the sink, he pulls another piece of paper towel and dries his hands. He scratches the back of his head. He begins to take deep breaths. He scratches the front of his neck. He opens his eyes wide and then closes them. He scratches the skin under his left eye. Several spots on his neck and face start to itch. While continuing to scratch, a huge pain fills Marcus's head. He balls his hands and pushes them against his forehead. It's almost like a thousand sharp weapons violating his brain. Up against the tile wall, Marcus squirms in place. With his teeth clenched, he first lets out a reluctant groan. As the pain worsens, a small whimper makes its way out of his mouth. He moves away from the wall, takes his fists off his head, and opens his eyes as wide as he can. He shakes his head as if he's trying to get something out, causing him to deliver a quick yet high-pitched shriek. Calming down, he feels something strange on the palm of his left hand. Holding it up to his face, he unclenches his fist to reveal two small square openings next to each other on the palm of his hand. These scars don't seem to be bleeding, yet inside them is pitch black. Marcus gags and puts his right hand over his mouth. Wincing, he begins to lean in closer to his palm to see what kind of abnormal, almost alien-like wound has been inflicted. He removes his right hand from his face. As he begins to search in the darkness of his palm, the wound squirts out a pinkish cloud of nicotine all over his face. He pulls back from his left palm, coughing and continuously opening and closing his eyes. Marcus is moving around the bathroom as if he's being tased. His body jitters and jumps like a Looney Tunes character. After clumsily bumping into the sinks and the stall, he falls to the floor. He lays there for a minute, ashamed and confused. The fuck? Am I gonna die? Am I dying? He thinks to himself. As soon as he sits up, lo-fi music can be heard from his pocket. He takes out his phone and sees that his mom is calling him. He answers the phone and puts it up to his ear. Yeah mom, I'm kinda busy right now, is it okay if I call you later? He says quickly. A few seconds later, he says, Okay, bye. He hangs up the phone and puts it back in his pocket. A few hours have gone by. The cafeteria is loud and chaotic. It smells more of the dry cleaning products that are used to clean the room than the actual food being served. Compared to the toilet in the boys' bathroom, it is pretty clean. 
While friends sit with each other in the vast room of chairs and tables, Marcus sits alone, hunched over in his seat. From his backpack, he is wearing his black and slightly worn-out hoodie. His head is hung low and obscured. The itching won't stop. The goop from his ear keeps leaking. He notices that a bit more of those black openings have appeared on his hands. The skin on them also have been starting to prune, as if he's been swimming for too long. He takes a look around the room, still trying to hide his face. Though he's used to all the talking and yelling and running, he thinks about how he would appreciate a bit of silence. Marcus struggles to think of one place to go where it's quiet. Going to the bathroom is a bit useless because he knows that usually during lunch is the perfect time for anyone to lounge anywhere and the bathrooms are popular spots. His eyes close. Now back in his thoughts, he wonders what the hell was in that jewel. Was it the pod? Was it the fact that it was only a prototype? Did Walter put odd chemicals in the mix? Marcus can't wrap his head around the idea that Walter intentionally did something this disgusting. He wonders if he ever agitated Walter in the past. After a few moments, Marcus finally starts to ponder on the real question. What will his mom think of? A hand shoves Marcus' shoulder. His eyes open out of shock. Still staring at the ground, he now spots a pair of vans in front of him. His eyes travel up the legs of the person wearing the shoes, only to spot the bottom of that brown leather jacket. Marcus rolls his eyes. Hey! Lena blurts out. Come with me, we're doing this, uh, this challenge thing, and I really want you there. Marcus sighs. He crosses his hands and continues to keep his head low to avoid questions. Um, I'm sorry, but... No, no, I, I'm, I'm sorry, he politely states. Lena shakes her head. Come on, it'll be fun and quick. It's not like you got anything better going on. Marcus stays silent to see if Lena will leave. You don't gotta do anything, Lena says. Me and Regina will jump next to you, and you just gotta jump after that. Lena places her right hand on top of Marcus's head, causing him to shrink in his seat. Is that good for you? Lena asks as she begins to pet him like a puppy. A long moment of silence between the two of them occurs as Lena continues to awkwardly pet Marcus's head. I said... No. Her petting stops. Hey, are we gonna do this challenge or what? Regina says as she approaches the two of them. Lena turns around to Regina. She has her hand resting on Marcus's head. Oh well, I'm not sure. Lena responds as she starts to grip Marcus's head. Why don't you ask this little dick right here? Regina looks at Lena confused, and as she moves her eyes to Marcus, there's a glimmer of sympathy in her eyes. Marcus, do you want to do the challenge with us? Regina asks. No. Marcus responds as he starts to feel an odd feeling in his throat. Well, okay. Regina nods. If he doesn't want to do it, then he doesn't want to do it. Come on. Lena whines. Changing her tone, trying to be cute. Don't you want to be in a video with two pretty pretty girls, don't you? Come on. I said no thank you, Marcus states, clenching his teeth. With a forced smile plastered on Lena's face, she cheerfully says, We promise it won't be anything too embarrassing. If I tell you it involves me and Regina's feet, would that change your mind? Lena's hand starts to pull back Marcus's hood. In a gut reaction, Marcus uncrosses his hands and uses his right hand to slap away Lena's. She stumbles backwards, offended, while Marcus quickly crosses his hands back the way they were. Did you just fucking slap me? Lena exclaims, dropping the cute girl act. Marcus's lungs are starting to become heavier. Something is bubbling in his stomach. Something is stabbing the inside of his throat. The goo from his ear is starting to slip through the ball of paper towel. Everything is hot and cold at the same time. He feels Lena's hand ferociously slap the top of his head, then the left side of his face, and then the right. Her foot crushes his right foot. Marcus winces. He still hears other students continuing their lunch. Lena starts to spit out insults towards Marcus, none of which Marcus has never heard of. She basically insults his clothing, his looks, and the fact that he is sitting alone. She also blames him for making contact with her brown leather jacket. Though he is dealing with constant body pain, Marcus is used to the pain that Lena inflicts. Then she said something that made Marcus explode. Smiling to herself and slightly out of breath, Lena states, hey, Yeah, and, and you know what? That slut of a mommy you got can fucking burn in hell. Yeah, what kind of woman, I, I mean, bitch, works in taking dick, has the time to love and support her fag of a son? Before Lena can finish. Marcus kicks Lena in the shin to knock off her foot from his foot. She steps back in a whimper. 
Despite his body weighing him down, Marcus erupts from his seat with all of his might and rips off his hood. Regina gasps, Lena's mouth agape. Marcus's face is dry, is covered in scars, scratches, scabs. Blood drips from his cheeks. The goo-soaked paper towel falls from his ear and splatters on the cafeteria floor. There are a few of those black openings scattered on his face. He stands tall, as if he's ready to fight. He has the devil in his eyes, as he yells at the top of his lungs for the whole cafeteria to hear. My fucking mom is a goddamn saint compared to you. She's more of a woman than you'll ever fucking be, you ignorant, manipulative, annoying, ugly, stupid bitch. The whole cafeteria is dead silent. Marcus observes that there are a few students with their phones out, recording the whole confrontation. He stares down Lena, like a predator about to catch its prey. Out of nowhere, the head pain he felt in the bathroom makes its return. Marcus grips his hair and squeezes it. His teeth are grinding against each other. Along with the head pain, he senses what can only be described as hundreds of tiny insects crawling and burrowing themselves all over his body. Panicking, he removes both of his hoodie and shirt over his head to inspect the rest of the horror inflicted on his skin. The whole room steps back. His skin tightens over his skeleton. The outline of his ribcage is visible. Those quadrilateral black openings are found all over his body. His hands, arms, chest, back, neck, and face. These openings are parallel with each other, like a pattern, and some of them leak the same goo coming out of his ear. A traumatized expression lingers on Marcus's face. His body now resembles the likeness of the beehive's honeycomb. Marcus lunges forward, inadvertently. He kneels to the floor with his head down. His eyes water as he feels his mouth begin to tremble. The teeth break, falling out of his mouth along with drops of blood. He groans in pain. The skin on his cheek tears as his jaw quickly unhinges. Like a blooming flower, the top and bottom of his mouth split in half, breaking the bone structure. The uncanny feeling in his throat begins to bubble. He staggers as he gets back on his feet. Marcus takes a look at Regina. She's crying uncontrollably, and her hands are over her mouth. She's frightened, but she can't help but feel sorry for him. Trying to communicate, Marcus mouths the word, Run! The look on Lena's face is utter shock. Her face portrays the emotions of an individual who is witnessing the unbelievable. A monster of flesh and bone stands before her. Pure terror. Pure fear. Jesus Christ, she says. Why are you so fucking rude? You kicked me in the shin and you just called me an ugly bi- In the blink of an eye, Marcus turns to Lena as a flood of vomit blood and awfully pink nicotine clouds ejaculates out of his mouth all over Lena's face. An inhuman screech crawls out of Marcus's mouth. The whole cafeteria detonates with shrieks along with the sound of quick footsteps trying to get to the exit. Regina is among the many struggling to escape, navigating through the sea of students. Marcus's eyes are bloodshot as pink nicotine slithers out of his pores. He can't move. What can he do? The vomiting continues for a while until it slowly starts to dial down. Blood and vomit is drenched all over Lena's jacket. A cloud of nicotine washes over her face only to reveal a skull dripping in fluids. Her body crashes to the floor with her skull cracking as soon as it makes contact. Marcus turns away from the body, realizing that he murdered a person. Despite Lena's lewd insults, he can't help to look at the corpse of his victim. He can't accept the horror he has caused. He spots his hoodie on the floor and grabs it with his left hand. Limping, he runs out of the cafeteria like everyone else. His left hand is covering his deformed, blood-dripping mouth, while his right hand is pushed against the side of his head. As he stumbles through the campus, Marcus looks back and forth, right and left, as if he's trying to find someone. Spotted in the chaos is Walter, frozen as a statue. Both of their eyes meet. Walter's arms are limp, eyes wide open, and mouth gape, petrified. Marcus reaches out to Walter, but after a few steps he falls to the concrete floor. Trying to get back up, he notices that both of his feet have been detached from his ankles. His shoes are emitting pink nicotine. Still motivated, Marcus crawls his way towards his friend. Still frozen in place, Walter has no response for Marcus. <sighs> Me. Marcus tries to say. With every inch of his skin now leaking the red goop, Marcus leaves a trail behind him. He grabs Walter's leg with both of his hands, pleading, 
causing Walter to snap out of his trance and take a step back. Please, please. Marcus attempts to get out of his mouth. In an instant, Walter's goop-covered ankle starts disintegrating. It detaches itself from his leg, causing him to fall on his bottom. Too stunned to scream, he contorts his face as if he's portraying a hundred expressions of terror. His eyes are about to pop out of his head. He backs away from Marcus, using his arms, and scurries away like a small animal in danger. As Marcus watches his own friend show very little to no sympathy, he finally realizes that no one else is trying to help him. Scanning the campus, students are found fumbling over each other with no clear directions on where to go. He examines a few still recording him on their phones, looking more concerned about getting a clear picture of his deformed body. Some of the teachers are even incompetent about the situation. An alien feeling overwhelms his body, due to the fact that this is the first time he has ever seen the school panic. He is so used to everyone staying calm and treating every difficult situation in an orderly manner. Pure disorder invades the school. Laying in the middle of the campus, he thinks to himself and recognizes that there is no hope. There is no god or physical treatment that can save him at this moment. With a combination of rage and guilt, Marcus lets out another projectile of nicotine vomit. Knowing that he's about to die, he lets every last drop of that repulsive fluid out of his mouth. He's accepting death, accepting defeat, deliberately not holding back. The vomit causes his neck and head to relentlessly flail around like a garden hose, shooting water with no one to hold it. The grotesque flurry of vomit makes spirals in the air in an oddly beautiful display, dancing in the air like paintbrush strokes on a canvas. It even reaches some of the students as if they are being blasted with acidic chemicals. It gets on their clothes, their hair, and face. Marcus eventually gains control of the vomit and aims his head directly at the sky, creating a fountain that reaches the height of the school's buildings. The skin on his body tightens as drops of his own bodily fluids rain around him. The black openings continue to disperse nicotine. His organs shrivel. He demonstrates a clear case of extreme anorexia. The vomiting abruptly stops. It feels as if there is nothing left in Marcus's body. He stares at the last remaining discharges flying to the sky. For a brief moment, Marcus has clarity. He softly closes his eyes, hoping to die at any moment. Everything is out. Nothing left to hide. Until... Like the green slime during the Nickelodeon's Kids' Choice Awards, the fluids come crashing back down all over Marcus's deformed body. It gets plastered all over his skin, creating a more inhumane burning sensation than the one Marcus was already feeling. He's trapped in an acidic puddle that is about to melt him away. Fumes of nicotine surround him. His hands now resemble nubs. It's finally his time. Oh, no more. No more. He blurts out. No more! Still staring at the sky, he hears something familiar. Something comforting. Disintegrating, he hears lo-fi hip-hop coming from his jeans. It's his ringtone. He knows who's calling. Though his body is liquefying and his limbs are being detached, Marcus is remembering his mother's face. Her eyes, her hair, the first time she spoke to him. He smiles to himself, looking up into the heavens. With a hint of guilt in his bloodshot eyes, he gets lost in the bright light washing over his face. He feels his mom cradling him in her arms. She's looking at him, teary-eyed, like he's the most precious thing she's ever held. The hospital's lights behind her make her look more like an angel. She mouths something that's muffled due to his newborn ears. Now understanding what she really meant, Marcus gives his last thought. I'm sorry. He responds, I love you too. His bones are exposed. His skeleton is jumbled in a lake of disgusting bubbling liquid that is embedded in the concrete. A rancid artificial smell permeates the school. In the center of it all lies a young man's corpse. His final moments on this earth will definitely not be forgotten. Yellow tape covers the school gates. Ambulances occupy the parking lot. Students that were harmed are being taken away on stretchers with a white cloth covering their body. 
The EMTs carrying away the students don't seem to be horrified by the damage. Parents are found worried, crying their eyes out. Police officers are inside the campus gates, wearing surgical masks. They stare at the large pool of bones and guts that continue to emit nicotine. Just like the EMTs, they seem calm, unfazed by the display of gore before them. One of the officers, with M. Joyce written on his nameplate, starts a conversation with another officer. Both of them seem to be fairly obese. Well, shit, Ackerman, Joyce says. Do we know the person that these bones belong to? Hmm? Ackerman asks, squinting his eyes and pointing to his mask. Do you know the identity of this corpse? Joyce yells through his mask, annoyed. Marcus Romero, Ackerman states clearly. They continue to stare at Marcus's remains. It's almost as if they are looking at a flat tire and trying to figure out what to do next. Behind them, a large bang on the gates make their heads turn. They see a middle-aged woman with her hands gripping the front gates. Her head is pressed between the bars. She's weeping, demanding someone's, anyone's attention to let her in. It sounds like she's yelling the words, My baby. But the officers can't make it out. They notice the yellow tape around her has been torn off. I just put those there, Joyce complains, pointing at the tape. He turns back to Ackerman and says, I gotta pick up dinner, you wanna come with me? Sure, Ackerman casually responds. Cool, I'll, uh, I'll get the car ready, Joyce says as he turns away from the incident. As he walks away, Ackerman turns back around and stops him. Hey, Ackerman exclaims. Yeah, what? Joyce says as he turns to face his fellow officer. Do you smell that? Ackerman asks. What? Joy hesitantly asks. I don't know, Ackerman states. It kind of smells like strawberries.